flock of curlews feeding together with snipe, godwit and other migrant waders on the eastern coastline of Norfolk. This was once a regular and common sight on estuaries and rivers throughout Britain in wintertime. But the curlew, Europe's largest wading bird, is suffering a dramatic decline. Some 58,000 breed here in the British Isles, roughly 28% of all the species of Eurasian curlew. During the last 30 years, the population of the British Isles has halved. Curlews will happily breed in a range of habitats that provide a wide open space with sufficient rough grass and ground cover and a damp feeding area nearby. They lay up to four eggs in a simple, shallow hollow. The eggs are particularly large in proportion to the adult female. Both parents share the responsibility of incubation, which lasts for about four weeks. Some pairs are known to have mated for life, faithfully returning to the same breeding site each spring. And ringing has proved that individuals easily live for 20 years, and some recorded as old as 40. Although the colouring of the feathers is almost identical in both sexes, the bird with the muddy beak incubating this nest is the male. As the population of curlews has fallen, so predation has become more pressing. Generalist predators such as foxes and crows have increased in the UK over the past 40 years and have a major impact on the breeding success of curlews and all other ground nesting waders. Crows eat the eggs, while foxes can take adults from the nest. Common buzzards are less of a threat to nesting curlews, but will catch young chicks given the opportunity. At changeover, the female announces her arrival, landing at a distance before walking in to avoid predators. Before leaving the nest to feed, he responds when his mate appears. For a brief moment, the eggs are vulnerable to predation by crows until she arrives. She is a larger bird with a considerably longer beak than her mate. The Latin name for the species, Numenius aquata, describes her beak as shaped like the new moon or a hunting bow. Since the 1970s, the loss of habitat and increased predation has brought about a massive drop in numbers, with lowland and southern England experiencing some of the most severe declines. For a long-lived bird, which was previously so well adapted to various landscapes and moderately tolerant of human activity, it's clear that considerable effort is required to stabilise their falling numbers. The species is now on the red list of birds of conservation concern, giving it the highest priority and need for urgent action. While often described as typical birds of wild heaths and remote moorland, historically Norfolk was not a favoured nesting area. Yet now they can be found breeding in the arable fields of eastern England. And in recent years, curlews have been attracted to the military airfields of the region, which provide the ideal basic requirements of open space and rough grass. Curiously, the birds are completely oblivious to the roar of jet engines day and night. But their tolerance is their undoing. A single flying curlew could destroy a Royal Air Force F-35 jet fighter in a moment if sucked into the air intake. For many years, the Ministry of Defence removed curlews under licence whenever they attempted to nest near runways. But now, a new approach is underway. The Natural England licensing officer is Graham Irving. We can't have the country's largest wader nesting close to runways due to the threat they pose to air safety. So under licence, we collect the eggs and take them into captivity to be eventually released as part of this project. I've been working with Pencil Conservation Trust, the British Trust for Morphology, Wildfire Equipment Trust, 
MOD and within the MOD the Defence Infrastructure Organisation and also several different airfield wildlife control unit contractors. Each clutch of eggs that I collect I individually number, I transfer them to a portable incubator and then transport them to Penstorpe where they are then incubated in captivity. The number of eggs saved from RAF airfields is a significant proportion of the local population. Graham has collected 147 eggs from across eastern England, representing about 40 nests that would otherwise have been lost. 106 of those eggs were taken to Pensthorpe Conservation Trust near Fakenham in Norfolk. The remainder being sent to a similar project in southern England. This strategy is known as head starting, a technique increasingly used to protect rare wildlife species by artificially raising their young in captivity for later release into the wild environment. But to be successful requires the most sophisticated system for artificial rearing of birds and the most experienced handlers and managers. As head of species management at Pensthorpe Conservation Trust, the project is led by Chrissy Kelly. It's our responsibility to look after the eggs when they're delivered from the MOD airfields and then all the way through incubation, the hatching of the chicks and the rearing of the chicks up until fledge at around 45 days old. Strictest hygiene rules are maintained in the incubation room as the key to success is to avoid every possible risk. So this is 11-1. Chrissy and her team leader, Kat, received the first clutch of eggs on April the 20th. On arrival, each egg is very precisely measured and weighed. 86.5. Every detail is recorded. Candling or shining light through the egg reveals embryo growth after four days. The Wildfowl and Wetland Trust has created a formula for curlew eggs which predicts each stage of incubation. Yeah. Okay. Cool. The incubators are set to maintain a stable temperature of approximately 37 and a half degrees Celsius. To mimic parental behavior, the eggs are turned automatically every hour to ensure good embryo growth during the four weeks of incubation. It can take two or three days, actually, from the first pit. Seeing the egg chipping out, hearing the chick call, and then at the very last, when they're very close to hatching out, that last push and seeing the chick, it's an incredible sight. Enormous egg size gives new chicks a good start for survival in the wild. Meanwhile, the team has time to prepare the outside runs. The runs are protected from avian predators with nets overhead and heated hutches provided for each new brood. This is a sophisticated, well-tried method developed by rearers of many species of birds throughout the world. Once hatched, the chicks are moved to another drier incubator to dry out and fluff up, and here they will absorb the rest of the yolk. When the chicks hatch, we put individual rings on them so we can follow that chick all the way through until they're released. Once fully dried off, they're transferred into the nursery containers kept warm with infrared heat lamps. And the brooders, the chicks are given a blanket and a soft mop mum to huddle into for comfort. But most are very happy just to relax under the lamp. Clearly, this situation of complete safety is far removed from the dangers faced by their wild relatives. 
these birds receive meticulous care and attention to detail. For them, it's a period of discovery. The chicks are instinctive foragers and soon start exploring and pecking. On offer is a special pelleted food that will be their main diet throughout. At five days old, and so long as they're looking active and strong, they're transferred to the outdoor facility, which is built like a fortress against ground predators like rats and stoats, which impact curlew chicks in the wild. The size of each run increases as the chicks grow. They're very busy, constantly hunting for live insects and worms. Moving chicks onto new ground is a highlight for these young birds. Being such instinctive foragers, they soon find lots of new food. With ideal conditions, such as warm, dry shelter and short grass, the chicks progress rapidly, growing and exploring. At first, their legs grow longer, giving them more speed and freedom to roam, and their necks lengthen too. In their early stages of development, all food is discovered by eyesight alone, as their beaks are still only a third of their eventual length. An adult curlew's bill is highly sensitive to vibrations detected in silt or mud, and it opens independently at the tip, working like a soft pair of tweezers. The curlew is a most versatile bird, worthy of this huge effort of conservation. These conservation projects are all about partnerships and teamwork. I have a fantastic team working with me here to ensure the health and well-being of the chicks as they go through those developmental stages. There's a lot of work involved. It's really intensive. And as you can imagine, we've had 80 or so chicks. They produce a lot of poo, <laughs> which all needs cleaning up. They need fresh food and water and, and a very watchful eye to make sure that they're, that they're staying healthy. The curlews have extremely noisy neighbours by night and day, members of the Corn Crake Project. Over the past 13 years, Chrissy Kelly and her team have reared over a thousand corn crake chicks for release back into the wild, another chapter of her wide experience of practical conservation. The Head Starter Project is backed by a broad range of conservation organisations, ensuring the best scientific support. Dr Sam Franks is the senior research ecologist for the British Trust for Ornithology. I just love Curlew and coming here where there are so many chicks in one place is a little bit strange because you'd never see this many chicks in a wild population normally in one place. We are here today to colour mark and ring the head started curlew. The purpose of putting on the colour marks is so that once these birds are released out into the wild, it'll be much easier for people to be able to see them and report either where their locations are and also what behaviour the birds are undertaking when people see them again. And we're hoping that this will allow us to get an idea of what birds do once they are released into the wild because we don't have a very good idea so far about how head started birds behave once they're released and also where they go. So we're also hoping to put three GPS tags on. So these tags will record locations using satellites and this will give us a real time picture of where birds are going as they move around the landscape. Sophisticated radio devices are also attached to the backs of some of the birds. This will allow them to be monitored after release. Since the arrival of the first clutch of eggs, the whole group of birds has been nurtured by the team at Pensthorpe for four months. Overall, the production rate has been exceptional. Of 106 eggs delivered from the airfields, 87 hatched, and 82 reached full fledging, a success rate of 
and a wealth of knowledge and new scientific data has been gained from the exercise so far. After 55 days, the oldest birds of the year are now fully fledged. The neighbouring oyster catcher heralds the beginning of the final part of the head started chick's journey. Transfer to the first release area. The eldest curly chicks were gently rounded up and caught in the pen. Because the chicks have only ever experienced slow, calm reactions by the team, they developed a tolerance of their human carers. There was very little stress. All the details of the rings and leg flags of each bird were recorded on camera. Although naturally sociable in the pens, they're separated, one bird per box, to avoid any risk of trampling or panicking. A lot of research had already gone into finding the best places in Norfolk to release the birds. Two private estates were chosen, 20 miles west of Penstill. Both locations very close to the best wader habitat in East Anglia, the Wash, that great expanse of tidal mud where hundreds of thousands of waders feed at low tide. Chrissy was on her way to the first release site, Her Majesty the Queen's Royal Estate at Sandringham. A release pen had been prepared by the estate gamekeepers, identical in size and layout to their nursery home. After so much time, effort and care, this was perhaps the most exciting stage of the whole project for Chrissy. It's absolutely fantastic to be part of this project. Partnerships uh, like this can make a real difference. Curlews are long-lived, they'll live for 40 years. So actually the power lies with, with policy makers and landowners because habitat is key. This would be the last time Chrissy held each bird, which she'd known since they were first hatched. The next release site was on the nearby Ken Hill estate a secure area of wet grassland, barely a few wing flaps from the eastern shore of the Wash. This is one of the first times that curlew in East Anglia will be released into the wild in Norfolk, and hopefully it will restore a population that, like many of the other curlew populations around the UK, is declining. This project really means um, hope for curlew for me. really looking forward to seeing the birds release. When you've reared birds in conservation breeding programs, that, that moment of release is just, is just the, the best part. It's just the best feeling when they actually get out there into the wild and start behaving like, like wild birds. Curlews need areas for safe nesting, and once they hatch, it's the foraging of finding the food and areas where they can hide away from predators that's really, really important. As the birds leave the release pen, they instinctively start foraging for natural food and finding it. And then they try their wings. Meanwhile, at Sandringham, after about a week in the release pen, the birds had settled well during their final days of captivity. On the morning of the 27th of July, His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales was present to witness this historic moment. He was accompanied by the chair of Natural England, Tony Juniper. The procedure was simple. Jamie, the gamekeeper, and Chrissy quietly removed the end panel. And then watched and waited as the birds walked out, without fuss or fear. The last group of curlews was released on the 14th of August, 
four months after the very first eggs were hatched as part of the East of England Nature Recovery Network, a project partnership with Natural England, Pensthorpe Conservation Trust, the British Trust for Ornithology, the Wildfowl and Wetlands Trust and the Ministry of Defence. The first boldest young curlew stepped out to discover a new freedom. The royal presence on this last day was a fitting endorsement of a team effort which saved around 120 curlew chicks this summer, hatched from eggs that in previous years would have been destroyed to maintain the safety of aircraft. The Prince of Wales has long cherished the call of the curlew, the most evocative song of any wild bird, which he feared was in danger of being a sound our future grandchildren may never have the chance to enjoy. But as a dedicated wildlife conservationist, Prince Charles was delighted to play his part of the first curlew head-starting project in Norfolk. <laughs>